Hey, I'm Melissa. And I'm Whitney. We started this true crime podcast over a glass of wine and quickly turned from true crime listeners into true crime advocates. So get comfy, pop a cork, and grab a glass because we have work to do. This is Colts, Crimes, and Cabernet. <laughs> Happy Monday. Happy Monday. Hope everyone had a great holiday and Christmas season. And one more holiday and then it's like nothing for a hot minute till Valentine's Day. So have a happy, safe New Year's Eve evening day, whatever, however you choose to celebrate. Stay safe out there. Stay warm with all the weather that's coming in for everyone. Most and definitely. Yeah. Yeah. You got your wine? I do. I believe I've had this one before. It's called Sister Snake. That That's familiar. Really it's a Cabernet from South Africa. Very delish. I really like it. Definitely nice on these cooler days. Awesome. Ready to get oh. into it? Jacqueline Marie de Wallaby was born on May 17th of 1981 to parents Cynthia and Jimmy Guest. They were only married a short period of time before they would divorce, before Jacqueline was ever born. After she was born, a custody battle ensued, with Cynthia gaining full custody. Cynthia would then marry David DeWallaby, and he adopted Jacqueline just six months after marrying her mom, when Jacqueline was two and a half years old. It was reported that David never missed a day of work in all of his years as a construction foreman until the day he adopted Jacqueline. He was ecstatic to be her father, and Jacqueline would never know any other father but David. The family lived in a single-family home at 3636, 148th place, Midlothian, Illinois. David and Cynthia had a son. And Jacqueline became a big sister to Davy in 1984. Jacqueline was a seven year old girl described as always being happy and smiley. This brown haired, brown eyed little girl would never see her eighth birthday. Midlothian, Illinois is a southwestern suburb of Chicago. The population was just under 15,000 in the 2020 census. I found it interesting that a village president is who runs this town, not a mayor or anything like that. Midlothian is actually considered a village. And it does have a much lower violent crime rate than the state of Illinois as a whole, but a higher property crime rate. Theft in this town makes up 57% of all the crimes. But Interesting. Plus- I know, it's crazy that many thefts going on. But luckily, in a typical year, there are zero murders. That would not be the case in 1988, which is when today's unsolved murder takes place. September 10th, 1988, was a typical night for this family of four. Cynthia, Jacqueline, and Davy had dinner at a local fast food place, while David, the dad, went bowling with some of his friends, he had he was on a league, so he bowled quite often. After arriving back home, Jacqueline put on her favorite nightgown, kisses her mom goodnight, and she goes to bed with her favorite thing this time of year, a Sears catalog. She was looking forward to the upcoming Christmas and wanted to circle what she was going to ask Santa for. I remember these catalogs, especially in the the 90s. I think we had Sears and JCPenney's. And I just would love to look through them, circle everything I wanted. I would even go to like a home decorating section of the catalog and pick out what I would want my house to look like. I remember the JCPenney ones like yesterday. We would count the days till they came in the mail and me and my sister would fight over them, over who got to look through it first. Yes, it was so Thick. Everything you can possibly think of was in those catalogs. 
I could imagine Jacqueline doing this, laying in her bed, flipping through the pages with a marker in her hand, anxiously awaiting for the upcoming holiday. Mind you, it's only September. School is about to be back in session and she is ready for Christmas. I can only imagine the smile on her face as she fell asleep dreaming that night. Yeah. The following day, David and Davy got up early to make breakfast. David saw that the front door was ajar, but he also noticed that his mother, who lived with the family, her vehicle wasn't in the driveway, so he assumed she had left it open by accident when she probably left early that morning. He just shut it, didn't really think much about it. Around 9.15, Cynthia decides to go wake up Jacqueline, only to find her bed empty. They really weren't too worried or concerned because they figured she had to be somewhere around the house or she was already outside playing with friends. After not finding any sign of her inside the house, the parents walked over towards the neighbors just to see if they can see her playing, possibly riding her bike. Again, no sign of her. But as the parents were walking back to their house, they noticed a broken window that led to the basement. And every parent's worst fear was happening to these two people who loved their daughter dearly. They reported Jacqueline missing, and the investigation started right away. The house didn't look as if someone had broken in besides the window being broken. Right underneath the window was a shelf. There was nothing disturbed on it. Police will state that there was a lot of dust and even cobwebs on this window as well. They didn't know if it was a kidnapping, considering there was little disturbance and no one heard anything. This kidnapper would have had to walk through the basement, up the stairs, down this hall that had very squeaky wooden floors to get to Jacqueline's room, which was also right across from her parents and right next to her little brothers. So this intruder would have to be either a ninja or very nimble. Yes, exactly. Exactly. And freakishly quiet because the parents still to this day are like, they cannot understand how they did not hear anything. The only thing found missing was Jacqueline's blanket from her bed and, of course, the sweet little girl. Another thing that police brought up was how did the kidnapper know exactly which room was Jacqueline's and go to her room if this is what happened? The initial search included local law enforcement, dogs, volunteers, firefighters, and a helicopter. So police wouldn't directly state it was a kidnapping because of the lack of disturbance and no one hearing anything. They were keeping their minds open. They were thinking, did Jacqueline possibly walk away on her own? Was she abducted by her biological father? Or did someone in the house have something to do with her disappearance? David and Cynthia were questioned for hours. They were given polygraph tests as well. And it seemed early on that authorities believed the parents could have something to do with this. When the news broke that the basement window looked as if it was broken from the inside and possibly done to look like someone had broken in, the media outlets began to crucify these parents. If this does not remind you of John Benet Ramsey, almost exactly same time frame in the late 80s, parents are the number one suspects. Police looked into Jimmy Guess, that was Jacqueline's biological father, and they determined pretty quickly he was in prison in Florida. Authorities were able to clear him because of this. They did look into him because Jacqueline had never actually met him in her whole life. She, all, she died believing that David was her father. On September 14th, four grueling days after Jacqueline disappeared, her body was found at a dump site in Blue Island. This is a neighboring town just six miles from her home. 
she was strangled with a piece of twine that was found around her neck. Jacqueline was wrapped in the blanket that went missing with her, and she was wearing her favorite nightgown. But her underwear was found near the body, not on her. Oh, no. I know. A man by the name of Michael Chapman is the one that found the remains. He lived in an apartment complex next to the dump site. And when he pulled into his parking spot, there was a foul odor coming from the woods. So bad that he went to investigate. And he got close enough to see something was wrapped in a blanket. And then he was able to see a head and an arm visible. He immediately ran to call the police. The remains were heavily decomposed, but it only took about a day for them to be identified as Jacqueline DeWallabies by dental records. This was September. It was an unusually hot summer already. So that is why the decomposition was pretty quick. An autopsy was unable to determine if Jacqueline was sexually assaulted. But the fact that her underwear was found next to her body makes me think the worst. I would agree. I don't know that there's any other reason as to why they would remove her underwear. Unless that that was the intent. Maybe they didn't follow through with the action, but that was at least the intent. Very true. Very true. They were able to determine that Jacqueline most likely died right after she was abducted in the early morning hours of Saturday the 10th, the morning she was discovered missing. David and Cynthia DeWallaby fully cooperated with authorities. They provided blood and urine samples, gave police access to their home for days, told police they could take whatever they saw fit from their house that might help solve their daughter's murder. Just one day after Jacqueline's funeral, police executed another search warrant at the family's home. Here, they took nine paper bags full of items and the family vehicle. This was a blue Chevy Malibu. The parents would then retain a lawyer and wouldn't speak to police unless their lawyer advised them to. They never, not even once, came out in the media or to the public. But reports say that this is because that the police told them it would hurt the case if they ever did that. So they were adamant they weren't going to talk to anyone until they got some sort of resolution or were told by the police that they could do so. November 22nd, a month and a half after their daughter was murdered, Cynthia and David were arrested for Jacqueline's murder. Authorities made this conclusion based on an eyewitness testimony. A man stated he saw a blue Chevy Malibu in the apartment complex next to where Jacqueline was found the morning of the 10th around 2 a.m., This witness said he even saw David DeWallaby driving that vehicle. He picked him out of a lineup. But what he basically said was the guy had a larger nose. It was something, a very distinctive nose. So when police showed him the different people in the photos for him to pick someone out, David was the one with the largest nose. Davy was put into foster care for a while until he was eventually placed with an aunt and uncle. So the parents are about to be on trial for their daughter's murder. Cynthia finds out she's three months pregnant. Oh, gosh. Yes. Luckily, the couple was let out on bond while awaiting trial. The baby, Carly, after she was born, was put under temporary guardianship of Cynthia's parents And they were allowed to see Davy on visitation. Davy was put into foster care for a while until he was eventually placed with an aunt and uncle. So the parents are about to start trial for their daughter's murder. Cynthia was three months pregnant when she was arrested. But luckily, the parents were let out on bond awaiting trial. The baby, Carly, after she was born, was under temporary guardianship of Cynthia's parents. And they were allowed to see Davy on supervised visitations for 12 hours a week. 
Cynthia and David did live with Cynthia's parents while they were out on bond and a while afterwards. So at least Cynthia had access to her newborn for a while because they had to sell their house in order to pay legal fees, the house that their daughter was taken from. I cannot even begin to comprehend the trauma and fear this family must have endured over the first few years after Jacqueline's death. Not only did their oldest daughter get brutally murdered, but their youngest son was taken away by the state. They're being charged with murder. And Cynthia gives birth to a baby girl, but she has to hand her over to her parents. Words cannot express what they must have gone through. At first, I thought meal kits had to be expensive, and you know how I like to stay on my budget. But now I'm convinced you can get the same convenience and deliciousness at a much lower price. Every plate's quality ingredients come pre-portioned to help you save money and reduce food waste. Like that bag of mixed greens you throw out every week. Think of it this way. One meal from every plate is about the same price as one cup of coffee. And probably cheaper than that pumpkin spice latte or peppermint mocha. Every plate makes it easy to find recipes everybody will love. Choose from family-friendly, quick and easy, meat and veggie, and just veggie. And you can try whatever you want without committing to one preference. Cozy up to new seasonal dishes featuring the highest quality ingredients like Tuscan mushroom penne and broccoli and cheddar mac and cheese, perfect for a cold winter night. I love how every plate saves me time by having all my ingredients together in one spot. And the recipes are easy to follow, especially on those busy nights running from school to practice. I need quick, easy, and healthy options. Every plate has even sparked an interest in culinary arts in my son. The recipes are simple enough for my nine year old to help. Get your first box for just a dollar forty nine per meal by going to everyplate.com slash podcast and entering code Cabernet one four nine. Get started with every plate for just $1.49 per meal on your first box by going to everyplate.com slash podcast and entering code Cabernet149. That's up to $110 value. September 9th of 1989. This is almost one year to the day of Jacqueline's kidnapping. A man by the name of Perry Hernandez raped and kidnapped a six-year-old girl in Blue Island. This was the town where Jacqueline was found, six miles from her house. Wow. We're talking tiny towns. Blue Island is smaller than Midlothian. And Midlothian only had 10,000 people. And surely this isn't just a coincidence. The guy even confessed about the Blue Island kidnapping. And said he had nothing to do with Jacqueline's murder, though. He said he did not kidnap her. He did not kill her. But the fact that two little girls were taken in such a close proximity, almost exactly one year apart, is unfathomable. I would say these are lumped together. Absolutely. The parents' lawyer actually thought this is their smoking gun. This is going to get them out. The fact that this guy has an MO of going into houses and taking little girls. This is going to be what gets the parents off. The jury didn't believe that this guy that confessed to the kidnapping was the one that kidnapped J Jacqueline. Because at the other little girl's house, he knocked over a lot of stuff. He left his fingerprints. He was an amateur. So because that didn't happen at the Dwallaby house, they say it could not have been the same guy. So that they just threw that out. That was not a thing for them at all. But the fact that this guy kidnapped a little girl in the middle of the night through a broken window, because he also broke a window at that house, did not matter to the jury at all. In April of 1990, the judge dismisses the charges against Cynthia for a lack of evidence. There is nothing against her. All they really had was an eyewitness testimony putting David in the apartment complex the morning that Jacqueline went missing. That's basically all they have. So Cynthia's released for lack of evidence, but authorities were full steam ahead on the case against David. 
And then in May of 1990, so this is just one month after Cynthia's charges get dropped, David was convicted of first-degree murder in the case of Jacqueline DeWallaby. One of the main reasons the jury convicted David had nothing to do with what was said in the courtroom. It had nothing to do with the evidence presented or the arguments the defense gave. It had to do with photos taken inside the DeWallaby house. On one of the interior doors, there was punch marks. I believe it's three or four. There are punch marks in these doors. And that is what one of the jury members stated convinced her that David was a violent man. Because How do they know it was from him? Exactly. So this house that the family lived in was actually David's childhood home. He grew up in this house. And the door that has the punches on it was David's brother bedroom. Later on, it comes out that this brother had a tantrum or threw a fit when he was 16 years old and had punched that door three times. And because it's the 80s and moms don't always have all this money, the mom just ended up putting a poster over the door. Like full disclosure here, when my sister and I were kids and we would rough house or whatever, we hit a hole in the door once and I put a poster over it. And until I for years, until I went to college, my parents didn't know it existed. Exactly. When they cleaned out my room and then it was like, oh, yeah, that happened 12 years ago, mom. Sorry about that. <laughs> yeah. What are you going to do? Ground me? Exactly. Um, I'm an yeah. adult. You can't. <laughs> yes. So this wasn't something that either the prosecution or the defense ever brought up. Nobody ever really said he was a violent man. And neighbors actually would report that David and Cynthia did not believe in corporal punishment. They didn't believe in spanking their children. They were much more going to take stuff away or put them in their rooms. But yeah, that is one of the reasons why they convicted him was because of those punch holes. I just also don't see how those punch holes would convict. That's not beyond a reasonable doubt. Not at all. Not at all. Because that could be literally. It could. It could. On October 30th of 1991, where over a year after David was convicted, His sentence was overturned entirely because the key witness, the one that said that he saw the blue Malibu at the apartment complex that day, he was about 75 yards away. He couldn't see who was in the vehicle, let alone if it was a man or if it was a woman. He said he could see the profile and that's how he knew the person had a larger nose. All of this actually came out in the cross-examination during the trial, but it really didn't matter to the jury. The jury believed the person, or if they didn't, they just wanted someone to pay for what happened to Jacqueline. This witness changed his story multiple times, and he only stated he saw a blue vehicle. That was after police told him the type of vehicle that David Dwallaby owned. Because at first he said it was a brown, it could be a brown, maybe dark blue, but it's nighttime, remember, and he's 75 yards away. And I really doubt there was a lot of street lights over that way because he would be closer to the woods. Yeah. So the unless it was like a full moon and there was street lights or people had exterior lights on their houses that show like spotlights or something. I don't see exactly. how he would be able to tell to say that. Distance. Yeah. Yes. David gets out of prison. All of the abuse allegations are closed as unfounded, so they get their kids back which is amazing. But now the couple, now they have time to finally grieve for their oldest daughter that was murdered, which just sucks all this time. She died in 1988 and it's not till 1991, the very end of it, before like things are seeming like to get back to normal as it could be after your child is murdered. Basically, the police could not believe that some came in from that basement window and did not leave any evidence. And the only other possibility in their mind was the parents had to do it. A possible person of interest that was briefly looked at the beginning of the case was Jacqueline's biological uncle on her father's side, her biological father's. This man's name was Tim Guess. He had an alibi back in the day, stated he did not know what happened to Jacqueline, And he said he was in a restaurant all night, the night of her disappearance. 
So this Tim guy lived with his mother, so Jacqueline's grandmother. And Jacqueline actually was able to see her biological father's side of the family a few times a year. Cynthia would let her go over there when other family was in town and things like that, just so she could get to know that side of family, regardless of the fact she never met her biological dad. So this Tim lived with his mom. So Tim knew Jacqueline, but he states he was at the restaurant this whole night, which is weird to me, but... And I would was, agree, but could anyone, like, confirm he was at the restaurant all night? What kind of restaurant was it? Is this a sports bar? He likes to bet on sports. He is watching all the different games. There's lots, I have lots of questions about this restaurant. Yes. There was people that confirmed he was there all night. Tim was diagnosed with schizophrenia and also had an intellectual disability, which made him seem like he was younger. Three people confirmed Tim's alibi of being at this restaurant all night. But what really matters is two of the three ended up recanting later on after David is released from prison. Tim is back on the police's radar. They bring him in for interviewing. They find out that his alibi is not really an alibi. Of course, I was like, what in the world? Why would these people lie for this guy? That was my question. Turns out they really thought David did it, so they didn't want to put any other person on the radar of police. Not a good reason to lie to police. Be honest so that they can get the right guy. Yes, exactly. So police started looking into Tim, interviewed him again. Even though he had never been into the Dwallaby home, he knew specific details about the layout. He said that he knew these details because of the spirit inside him. When asked how to get to Jacqueline's room, he said, and I quote, I walked past Davy's room. Then he quickly added, that was the spirit talking, not me. I didn't say anything. I just released the information. Okay. However, friends of Timothy's would say that he would believe whatever you told him. This was part of his mental disability. He would even tell people he worked at this restaurant, but he really just hung out there regularly. He might help out, like, cleaning off a table or something like that, but he did not work there. The owner was adamant he would just spend a lot of time at this restaurant. And this restaurant is more an all-night cafe, uh, diner-type place where a lot of regulars continue to go. Did he frequent this location? Yes, he did. Yeah, he was actually would go there on a regular basis for seven to eight years. Oh, gosh. So he was really a regular. Yeah. All the waitresses knew him. Other regular customers would know him. And that is how those three people said he was there originally. Gotcha. Okay. The owner would say that he yelled at Tim once and Tim cried his little eyes out. They said he was not violent or angry at all. Timothy, guess, died in 2002 without any additional information coming out or without him ever being officially charged. So honestly, to this day, I don't know if he did it. There's obviously not enough evidence out there to prove he did anything. It has been 34 years since Jacqueline Marie DeWallaby was taken from her bed with her blanket around her and brutally murdered and thrown in the woods. Police state the case is active, but they are not pursuing anything, possibly because they believe they had it right the first time, or they don't want to actually admit they were wrong the first time. Possibly no new leads, nothing to go on to find this child killer. Jacqueline will forever be seven years old. Just by listening to our content, you too are advocating for justice for these families. Thank you for making a difference in their lives as well. We want to share a few ways you can support us to continue our mission. You can become a Patreon subscriber for as little as $1 per month, or a simple rate and review on your favorite podcast platform helps us get in front of someone who may know something. We will continue traveling state by state, seeking justice, because we will be there no matter where, no matter who.